Okay, thanks, Cheng, for the kind introduction. Uh, thanks for having me here in Hamburg. So you can see the title of my presentation, Well Steered is Half Measured. It's about electromagnetic compatibility measurements in reverberation chambers. Uh, so we operate three of these chambers in Magdeburg. I have done research in this field for more than 15 years now. Uh, I'm a scientific co-worker and I also say I'm a chief officer of student happiness at the Otto von Guericke University of Magdeburg in Germany. And so before we actually dive into the topic of reverb chambers, I would like to give a brief overview um, over other EMC test environments. So the very classical one is the open area test site. You just take your equipment under test, uh, put it on an open space, put an antenna in a certain distance, let it radiate and measure the emission. Or you could also irradiate onto some device and measure the, the immunity, the susceptibility. But of course, you're prone to bad weather conditions. It's not very working in the winter. And today you have so many ambient fields on the outside that you measure lots of um, cell phone networks, radio stations, and so on and so on. So you, you need to somehow shield yourself from the environment. Uh, the topic of shielding was just topic in the lecture of uh, Professor Schuster, who invited me uh, today here to, to Hamburg. So the idea is then you shield yourself from the environment. You take metal walls, a metal floor, metal ceiling, metal doors, and metal works for the electromagnetic waves like a mirror. So everything all waves from the um, cell phone networks and radio stations and so on that come from the outside, they are mirrored back, which is nice. But inside such a shielded room, all the walls are also reflecting. So if you generate something on the inside, it will be also reflected and re-reflected from the walls. And so imagine you are in a room uh, full of mirrors and you turn on uh, a flashlight. What will happen? You see lots of reflections from, from other directions. So you don't know anymore from which direction is some electromagnetic wave coming and where it's, where it's going to. Um, so you, you would like to have the walls to be absorbing. And so this is how semi-anechoic chambers and anechoic chambers, um, absorber chambers have been developed. And we have also one of them uh, with a 10 meter measurement distance in Magdeburg and 10 meter means we can start to measure from 30 megahertz. Um, and these absorbers are like black paint for light, like in a Rolling Stones song, painted black, and like that the walls are not reflecting anymore. So they're also fully anechoic rooms. So the, the same anechoic chamber with the conducting floor is more or less a replica of the open area test site. Fully anechoic rooms are not so comfortable from my point of view because you cannot walk in them with the absorbers on the floor. Um, but yeah, and we, we just have a very small antenna measurement room like this in Magdeburg. And the other, um, yeah, not so established, also kind of alternative test environment are GTEM cells, which are practically like you do the measurement in a large coaxial cable. So you have um, a coaxial feed here at the, at the tip of this GTEM cell. And then the, the outer case is like the shield, like the outer conductor of the coaxial cable. And the inner conductor is inside there. It's called septum. And then between the septum and the shield, you get some electric field pointing downwards. You get some magnetic field going in circles around the septum. So you have a magnetic field pointing in this direction and you have waves propagating um, from, from the tip towards the end, which is also covered with absorbers inside this GTM cell. And because the electric field, the magnetic field and the direction of propagation are perpendicular to each other, um, it's called the transverse electromagnetic field. And the cell also works at gigahertz frequencies, and that's why it's called the GTEM cell. And the good thing is that we have one of these semi-anechoic chambers in Magdeburg. We have a GTEM cell in Magdeburg, and we also have uh, three reverberation chambers in Magdeburg, so we can kind of do comparative measurements between them. So now, before diving into this topic of reverberation chambers, I've prepared a short survey for you. So it would be great if you take out your cell phone, scan this QR code, uh, which should bring you to this web page. And I will also, uh, I, I will wait for a couple of seconds until no cell phones are pointing at me anymore. And then also uh, a switch in my browser to this web page. And I can maybe for the couple of Zoom attendees, which makes it easier, uh, pop the link into the chat. If I find the chat quickly, there it is. 
So there is the link in the chat for the Zoomies. And um, the website should, I think, look like this. And there are already 12 answers, so probably you have found it. And if I, so there are already 19 answers. Um, does anyone need the QR code once again? Does not look like this. Um, so if I, I think if I press space, we should see the answers. Okay. And so a quarter of the people say, I've never heard of reward chambers before. So you're, you're the perfect audience for my talk, I would say. And, uh, half of you, uh, less than half of you say, okay, I know that, if, that they exist, but I never really used it. And some of you have, have some more experience and already conducted some measurements. Okay. Excellent. Uh, thanks for this feedback. So. To, to further motivate the topic, um, Karl Baum, unfortunately already passed away, was also a great uh, researcher and scientist in electromagnetics. And he has written a kind of funny, humorous paper um, 25 years ago, which was called The Microwave Oven Theorem. Um, in, in the microwave memo series, this was the number three, and it was called All Power to the Chicken. And it's kind of more funny in English uh, because power means electrical power, but it also means this political power, power to the people movement and so on. And, 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 and if you translate this into German, the, the joke does not make too much sense. And in, in within this paper, and we will come to this uh, later, he asked the question, what's the difference between a microwave oven and a reverberation chamber? And, and also answers this question and says, okay, in a microwave oven, you cook You cook chicken and in the reverb chamber, we cook electronic chicken. We test electronic equipment for electromagnetic fields. And if this is, let's say, the main message that you get out of my talk, a reverb chamber is like a large microwave oven, then you have already more or less understood about the topic, right? So we, we have very large microwave ovens and we don't cook chicken. We cook electronic chicken. That, that's more or less it. Okay, so... After this very, very brief uh, motivation introduction, we can have some overview about some reverberation chambers. We can take a look into some physical theoretical fundamentals. Then, uh, as you have, might have learned also in the EMC lecture of Christian Schuster, there are some standards, norms to do EMC measurements, also in reverb chambers. We, so we will have a very brief look onto this. And at the end, there, might, there will be some comparison with the other test environments that I've mentioned at the beginning. So the setup, uh, once again, is very simple. Uh, we also take a Faraday cage. We also take a shielded room because we want to shield ourselves from the environment. So then we have some equipment under test somewhere. And we typically have a pair of antennas, one that we use as a transmitting antenna, one that we use as a receiving antenna. And let's assume that we want to do some immunity tests. So we take this transmitting antenna and let it, let it radiate electromagnetic waves. And what will happen is there will be a wave going in this direction. It will be reflected from the wall. And it will be reflected and re-reflected and re-reflected and re-reflected. So you get a superposition of lots of traveling waves and you get standing waves. So you get points in space where the field strength is very high, where the field is oscillating a lot, where we have a high field strength, the anti-nodes of the standing waves. And you get points in space where there's almost no field strengths at all because there's uh, negative interference of the waves, which are the nodes of the standing wave pattern. So if you, if you would like to do EMC tests in this kind of environment, in a simple cavity resonator, you would need to take your equipment under test and move it around to find some position in space where you have a high field strength. This is what you do in your microwave oven at home because you have this turntable. The turntable moves the field, moves the food around in the field so that the food gets evenly hot and not burns at some places and stay cold at, cold at other places. And for the EMC test, you don't want to move your equipment under test around because it might be heavy. There might be cables attached to it and so on. It's not very comfortable to do so. So the idea is like in the saying, if the profit cannot go to the mountain, the mountain needs to go to the profit. You, you leave your equipment under test in place and you move the field around. And moving the field around works with a large metallic, metallic object with pedals, pedals, metallic pedals uh, attached to it. And the waves are also reflected as at this metallic object. Um, and if we move this, if we rotate this, we change the reflection of the waves and we change the standing wave pattern inside this cavity resonator. And These standing waves in electromagnetics, they're also called modes. 
and we, we steer this mode with this mode steerer, and that's why the whole thing is called a mode steerer chamber. Or a reverberation chamber, because reverb means echo, there's lots of echo, lots of reverberant field within this um, structure. Yeah, and this is more or less how the field inside looks. So you have, uh, you have a strongly inhomogeneous field, and just by rotating the steerer, changing the electromagnetic boundary conditions, you get a statistically homogeneous and isotropic field. So and then we can talk about good and bad steerer design. Um, what, what would you say? What makes a good mode steerer to change this electromagnetic field pattern inside the cavity? What would be parameters um, of, a, of a good steerer design? Any ideas? From the reverb experts in the room. The dimensions of the steerer shall be obviously uh, be related with the wavelengths of uh, what you are intended to. Exactly. So to, to make some interaction with the field, the steerer must be large. So a larger steerer will always be better, but of course it's mechanically more heavy and you need more, it has more inertia, you need more power to rotate it. And so, so size is one important parameter. And the second thing is it should be asymmetric. It should really, if you rotate it, it should change something. You can take a very large cylinder, like imagine there is this cylindric uh, column here in the, in the room. If you rotate the cylinder, even if the cylinder is very, very large, nothing will change because it's very symmetric. So. Um, I, I have some examples of yeah, the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, it, but it's more like the, the, the bad and the good. So this is our old steerer design in Magdeburg. Um, it had a triangular base, and then there were some metal sheets attached to it in different orientations and so on. But if you look at this, it more looks like a strangely shaped cylinder. If you rotate this, not so much will happen. And so... I don't know, four or five years ago, we changed it into this classical Z-fold steerer design, which is very asymmetric. So something points in this direction, and if you rotate it, it will somehow point in the total opposite direction. So this is a much simpler, still much better steerer design than this. Okay, so then why, why do EMC engineers would like to do tests in reverb chambers? Because it's a resonator, it has a high quality factor, so... With small input power, you get quite high field strength. This is one big advantage. In a semi-anechoic chamber, you have a very powerful and very expensive amplifier. You generate your RF wave, then it hits your device on a test once, goes into the absorbers, and poof, is converted into very expensive heat. And now in here, you take your powerful amplifier, you generate a field, it hits the device on test, but then it gets reflected and hits it again. It gets reflected and hits it again. So you, you kind of recycle if you so, uh, if you like, you, you kind of cycle the electric wave. So that's why you have relatively low costs and you get this statistic field, which makes you get robust tests. We will come to this in a second. And of course, um, where there's light, there's also shadow. You also have some drawbacks. Otherwise, everyone would just do tests in reverb chambers anymore. You need to do statistics. Um, from a mathematical point of view, this can be complicated. Then you cannot say anything or it's very difficult to say something about directivity and polarization because you don't know in your, your device can radiate in any direction. It will be always reflected and come back to your antenna. Then the chamber and your equipment are not test. They will be somewhat coupled with each other. So you have to take care of this. And it's we will also... Uh, come to this at the end, it's kind of difficult to compare the results with the established test environments. There are, there are no limits for emission, for example, for measurements in reverb chambers. Okay, so this is how a classical setup looks like. This is a picture that you can also find in the IC standard for reverb chambers. So you have your chamber, you have one stirrer, um, then you define something that is called a working volume because you can only achieve these statistical field conditions that you would like to have in a certain distance from the walls. And there might be a second cabinet for your measurement equipment for the amplifiers. You might have a second stirrer. You might even have a third stirrer. And then often it makes sense if they have different axes of rotation and you have this um, transmitting and receiving antenna inside there. And this working volume should have a distance of at least quarter of the wavelengths from the walls. 
So then I can show you some pictures of our chamber set. We have a Magdeburg. This is our largest one. It's about six by four by eight meters. So um, half of the size of this room here, I would say. This is also a very famous picture. If you search the English Wikipedia for electromagnetic reverberation chamber, you will find this picture from the chamber in Magdeburg. Very popular with this motorcycle, which, as I was told, was the motorcycle of a student. It was never actually tested. It was just put into the chamber to make the picture look nice and it somehow worked out because pic picture got famous. So people who took this photograph were good science communicators, I would say, at this time. And uh, the first cavity resonance there is at 30 megahertz and the lowest usable frequency with the old stirrer is somewhere at around 250 megahertz. Now I would say we can go down to 180, 200 megahertz, something like this. So then we have a smaller chamber. Smaller chamber, why? Because if you in input the same power into a smaller volume, you get higher power density, you get higher field strength. So this is the advantage. Here in this chamber, which is a little more than one cubic meter, with a 100-watt amplifier, and a 100-watt broadband RF amplifier costs about like a good car, I would say. But with this power amplifier, you can reach field strengths of around one kilovolt per meter, which is quite a lot. But because it's smaller, operating frequency goes higher. So here, smallest cavity resonance is at around 160 megahertz and usable frequency range starting at one gigahertz. And then we have a very, what we call tiny reverb chamber. It's a tabletop device, uh, mainly used for handheld devices. Um, it's very small and usable up to or up starting from two gigahertz. Uh, you can see with a very simple stereo design, just one pedal uh, moved by a stepper motor and very strange snail antennas that have a horrible radiation pattern, but you don't care about the radiation pattern um, inside the reverb chamber as long as the antenna is well matched and, and, and broadband. Okay, so then if you want to read more about this, as mentioned, there is a technical standard um, that explains all the validation and the measurements. Then there's a, yeah, a book or some technical report from colleagues from NASA uh, or from, from the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado, but who built a chamber for the NASA. And it's like a, it's like a, like a manual, like, like if you go to Ikea and would build, build, buy a reverb chamber. So it's really written in a way. Let's take some metal sheets. Let's put it together the way how to build it, how to calibrate it and so on. So it's a, from a practitioner's point of view, it's a very good book. And so there are other standards. The automotive industry has some ISO standard. And uh, the aircraft industry also has some RTCA uh, DO160 standard that is used there for some measurements. Okay, so now we can have a look into some theoretical fundamentals. And the first thing is that I have a, another survey for you. Um, and I think I need to, you, it, it should be the very same QR code. You can scan it once again. And I think I have to enable the second question first. So if I go next and uh, say freigeben, uh, then you should see this question. I can I can show the QR code once again. And so the question is, uh, if we have this cavity resonator and if the excitation frequency exactly coincides with an eigenfrequency of the chamber, which is the definition of a resonance, what will happen then? Do we get some incredibly high field strengths or it's not possible as the frequencies will never exactly match or nothing spectacular because this is the usual operation of a reverb chamber or mm, some large, large power will be reflected from the transmitting antenna back to the power amplifier. So we have only four answers so far. So uh, seven. So we will, we will wait. Uh, but now there are 14 answers. And for the Zoomies, it should be the very same link as before. So if you close the web page in between, you can just open it up, uh, open it up once again, if you like. And so now we have 20, more than 20 answers. So I will press space to show the results. And okay, so um, almost half of the people say there will be an incredibly high field strength. And um, a little about a third say, and this is, uh, to spoiler the answer, this is the correct answer. Nothing spectacular. This is the usual operation of a reverb chamber. 
And some say a large power will be reflected back. Yeah, so if, if we have no resonance, then a large power would be reflected back from the antenna. If the chamber is in resonance, then the chamber absorbs the energy uh, from the power amplifier. So in, in a resonance, we have no, no big reflection. Um, and yeah, the field strength is high, but it's not incredibly high. It's the usual operation. And the reverb chamber works well if we don't hit just, if we don't excite just one of the resonances in the chamber, it works well if we excite several resonances at the very same time. This is the usual operation, the overmoded condition that we would like to have in a reverb chamber. Okay, so let's have a brief look at an empty cavity resonator. Um, if you have a lecture on theoretical electric engineering, um, th this should look familiar. So it has dimensions A, B, and C. And you can calculate resonant frequencies by this formula uh, using the velocity of light and L, M, and N are non-negative indices. And uh, one of them can be zero. And if you calculate this for the dimensions of the large chamber in Magdeburg, you end up with these resonant frequencies. So you can see the first one is at around 30 megahertz. And then the next one is at shortly below 45, shortly above 45. And then they are closer and closer together. So this is calculated for these dimensions here. And now if we would plot them all into one diagram. So here's the frequency axis. And here's the accumulated number of modes curve would look like this. So here's the first one at 30 and then 45, 46, and so on. And then there you can see they are closer and closer together. And the hundreds mode is at around 140 megahertz. And here at 200 megahertz, we have already 200, 300 um, of these modes. And so now if we look at this frequency region here, around 200 megahertz, um, and introduce a second important parameter, which is the quality factor that was mentioned before. So quality factor is the, the ratio of the stored energy divided by the average power loss. And um, so loss mechanisms in a, in a reverb chamber, what will cause losses? Of course, you have losses inside the walls. You have losses in the stirrer. Um, especially at high frequencies. At low frequencies, the main loss mechanism are the antennas because at low frequencies, you have large wavelengths and large effective areas of the antennas. And then also everything that you put inside the chamber, um, your EOT cables and so on, they will also load the chamber. And within the dielectric, the losses inside the air are usually very small. And so because of the quality factor, we now get... A bandwidth. So each of these resonant frequencies can not only be excited at this particular frequency, but will get a bandwidth. Um, so quality factor is resonant frequency divided by bandwidth or one over relative bandwidth. And this means now we, we can excite a field not only at this particular resonant frequencies, but also in the surrounding area. So now if we look at, um, at a rather low frequency, 125 megahertz, you can see that there's a resonant frequency here and a resonant frequency here and there. And they all have a bandwidth that is now calculated for quality factor of 1,000. And if we take a look at the superposition of the field, you can still distinguish these single resonant frequencies. So this is not, not a good way of operating a reverb chamber. This is what we would call undermoding. It's, it's not working very well. If we take the same quality factor of 1,000, but double the frequency, if we go to 250 megahertz, now there are much more modes inside this frequency band. So if you now take a look at the superposition, it's much more of a flat curve. And this is what we would call overmoding. These are good uh, operating conditions for a reverb chamber. Thing is, if you have a too high quality factor, if you have too few losses, so this is the same frequency now at around 250 megahertz. Exactly, if I, if I go back, it's exactly the same resonant frequencies, but smaller bandwidth. Now you can once again distinguish the resonant frequencies from each other. So yeah, too, too high quality factor is also sometimes detrimental. Um, sometimes it helps to load the chamber just a little bit, let's say. Okay. So then. Now we need to go from the um, cavity resonator to reverb chamber. We, we somehow need to steer the field. So 
We can have a mechanical steerer. We could move a wall. We could shake walls. Uh, um, we could, you could move the transmitting antenna around. You could also switch between several antennas, which would be called electronic steering. Um, or if you just do an immunity test, you can also step the frequency in very small steps. And the idea is because of the high quality factor and small bandwidth of the reverb chamber, if you change the frequency just a little bit, the field in the reverb chamber will already change a lot, but the effect on the equipment under test should be almost negligible because your equipment under test will not have a super high quality factor and not super small bandwidth. But of course, you can only do this for immunity testing. Yeah, and this is um, a picture of Frank Leffering, who's working at Twente and for Thales, and they have um, made this concept of this tent vibrating intrinsic reverberation chambers, as they call them popular. Um, so Thales is a large manufacturer of radar systems for ships. And of course, the ship is very big. You cannot move the ship to your EMC laboratory. So you once again have to move the EMC laboratory to your ship. Um, so they do in situ testing on the ship. And there's a nice demo video that you can also find on the internet uh, where they demonstrate this concept. And yeah, there are chambers with such oscillating wall stirrers. It's an interesting idea from an academic point of view. At the end, I would say it's not very practical. I would not recommend to build such a chamber, let's say. Okay. And because of these very different ways, um, what happens there to steer the field, there, there are lots of different words which mean the same thing. Yeah? In Germany, we call it Modenverwirbelungskammer. Um, except for the Technical University of Braunschweig, somewhere from Braunschweig here today. Because in Braunschweig, I think it was called Feldvariable Kammer. At least uh, this was the common, common term there. Yeah, but uh, in the English literature, you find lots of different technical terms for this. And the statistical properties, as mentioned, the field is statistically homogeneous. So it does not matter where you place your equipment under test. It's isotropic. So it means the, the direction is not important. And uh, this makes for very robust tests. So it does not matter how to align cables, for example. Um, and there's a third important statistical property, and this is called ergodicity. And this means you can interchange different statistical ensembles. So, for example, if you don't rotate the stirrer, if you leave the stirrer like it is, and you get this inhomogeneous field, and you probe the field at different positions, and calculate some average, an average over different spatial positions should be the same average as if you take a field probe, leave it at one position, and measure for different steps, rotations of the of the tuner, of the stirrer. So um, this is what means ergodicity. And this is, yeah, it makes the mathematical description a little bit complicated sometimes, but uh, from a practical point of view, it's very good from my point. Okay. So then we can have a look um, into this IEC standard. And the first thing, if you build a new chamber uh, or if you buy one, is that you do some empty chamber validation or calibration. It's more validation. So you want to show that the field is homogeneous and isotropic. And you want to determine this lowest usable frequency from where you can use your chamber. And so you do it for the empty chamber. And you also do it for a maximum loaded chamber. So you put lots of absorbers inside there and still show that the field conditions are good. And then you assume, okay, if you put any equipment under test in there that has a loading between this empty loading and the maximum loading, if it will be good in both like uh, um, worst cases, then it should be also fine in between. And then... For every equipment under test that you put inside there, because of the coupling between the EUT and the chamber, you would also need to do another validation measurement to account for this additional loading. Of course, if you have a very large chamber and if you have, let's say, a very small equipment under test, you can assume, okay, it will not really load the chamber. You can probably um, don't do the test, just skip it. But if you put something large inside there, um, it's it's a good advice to do so. And you just do one field probe, uh, no, no field probe measurements, but just one location of the reference antenna to make it, uh, to make it a little faster. But this, of course, 
um, introduces some, some higher statistical uncertainty. So then for the radiated immunity test, you insert a certain amount of power and power is proportional, uh, as we have also just discussed in lecture before, proportional to the square of the field strength. And there's some proportionality factor between them. And this proportionality factor you get from this empty chamber validation and from the EOT validation before. Um, and then there's a formula that tells you if you want to test for 100 volts per meter, you need to introduce this and this power to get this field strength on average, let's say. And for such an immunity test, you usually uh, remove all unnecessary loading equipment because you want to have this high quality factor, low input power, high field strength. So no wooden tables, no coverings on the floor and on the walls and so on. And then as usual for EMC testing, uh, you take a logarithmic spacing of the, on the, of the frequencies and um, step through the frequencies, have a certain dwell time, um, and then yeah, you just need to monitor your, your equipment under test. And it's, um, yeah, because at the end, you never really know what happens. It's not advised to rotate the stirrer and sweep the frequencies at the same time because uh, then if you if you fail somewhere you you don't know at which frequency at which stereo position this happened okay and for the radiated emission measurement um you put some antenna inside there then you measure the average received power with this antenna and once again you have some factors and from this you get the radiated power of your equipment under test and the variables inside there, this is uh, once again something that you get from the validation before and you need to have the efficiency of the transmitting antenna, uh, which is also kind of difficult to measure, but you can assume something like 75% for logarithmic periodic dipole antennas and maybe 90, 95% for horn antennas. Okay, and then there is a third and last survey and I will enable it first by going to the next question and, uh, and say freigeben and then it should pop up on the very same page and if you like you can scan the QR code once again and the question is what is difficult to be measured in a reverb chamber is it shielding effectiveness of cables, connectors, waveguides, passive microwave components, or shielding effectiveness of gaskets and materials, both also once again very related to the to the EMC lecture before? Um, modulated signal measurements of wireless devices, telecommunication devices, or antenna efficiency or antenna directivity. And if you have carefully listened to my talk, I may have spoiled the answer before. So let's see what will happen. We already have 19, 19 answers. Uh, now we have 24. So I will press space and uh, see the results there. And most of you have selected the right answer. Um, antenna directivity. This is something that is complicated to measure. You, you, you can, you could if you like, but then it's what you need to do at the end is separate um, the direct component from the from the scattered from the reverberant component because they have different statistics. Um, so you 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 could if you like, but it's not the best way to do so. And modulated sig signal measurements is also kind of a challenge because of this high quality factor on and let's say the the time constant of the signals. But it's um, it's much more doable than antenna directivity measurements. Okay, uh, thanks for your feedback. So let's come to the last section, comparison with other test environments. And the first question or idea there is a very general one, um, especially for immunity testing. And the question is, if we do some immunity test, let's say for a field strength of 100 volts per meter, um, what is meant by this electric field strength? And this is what people would do in, in, in a semi-anechoic chamber on an open area test site. They would just say, hey, we have tested this for a field strength of 100 or 30 or whatnot um, volts per meter. And the question is, 
30 volts per meter. Is this the total field strength? Is this a Cartesian component of the field strength? Is this the average field strength? Is this the maximum field strength? Is this the minimum field strength? Is this, is this the, 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 um, squared field strength and so on? And if you have a simple plane wave like the one that is shown here, it's very simple because everything is the same. Average, minimum, maximum, Cartesian component, total field component. You, you need just one number to describe, to express your whole field. And the thing is, in a, in a reverb chamber, all is different. So Cartesian component is different than the total field component. And you have a minimum, you have a maximum, you have an average that is somewhere in between. And you also have these, um, these effects that if you, if you take the square of the field strengths and average, it's different than if you average first and then take the square. So the squared average is not the same as the average square, right? Because of the statistics. And so this makes it very complicated. If someone says, I have done a test on 30 volts per meter in a reverb chamber, you can say, yeah, nice that you have done so, but what do you exactly mean by this, right? Is it, is it maximum? Is it average? Is it Cartesian? Is it total field? What is meant by this? So uh, this is not valid for a reverberant field. And so this was for immunity. Now looking at emission, there's another problem for the comparison. And um, to dive into this, we would need to talk about the electrical size of an equipment under test. So let's say this is our equipment under test. We put some um, sphere around this, the, the smallest sphere surrounding that UT and call the radius A. And then the, the electrical size is wave number K multiplied with this A. And then the question is, okay, what belongs to this UT? Do you count cables in and what lengths of cables has to be considered? But let's say we have some UT and we take this electrical size. Now, if this electrical size is smaller than one, it's very simple. Everything radiates like a dipole and the radiation pattern of a dipole looks like this donut. And it's very easy to find the maximum emission of this donut because if you sample in this direction and this direction, or let's say if you sample in this direction, this direction, this direction, this direction, you will, you will always hit the maximum. So if you do 90 degree steps, you will always find the maximum. I don't know if in our snack bar we have donuts today. I don't think so. They are not too, too popular in Germany. Um, in, in, uh, I, I've given these talks in, in Canada. We always had donuts, uh, to, to, to demonstrate this. So now if you go to electrically large UTs, it's getting more complicated. And for this, I have a video that I would need to find. Uh, it's here. It's some video that has been, um, produced by my colleague Magnus Hoyer of the Swedish Defense Research Organization. And so they have taken a very large, equipment under test, some cabinet sized thing and measured in one plane, one spherical cut, the radiation pattern. And you can see, so we are sweeping through frequency. It started at 0 0.5 gigahertz. And I think the video is ending at 20 gigahertz or 18 gigahertz, something like this, that this radiation pattern gets more and more complicated. And it's very, so now the maximum is here, then the maximum is there. Now it's there on top again. And if you, if you would measure just 90 degree steps, you would never find the maximum. <laughs> and so it's very, very challenging uh, to find the maximum emission. But this is exactly what you're trying to do in a semi-anechoic environment, in a, in a semi-anechoic chamber on an open area test site. You're trying to find the maximum emission um, of this equipment under test. And you would need to do very, very small steps of the turntable to find the maximum emission. And if, if we go higher in frequency, I will skip forward a little bit. Yeah, so you can see now we are at 15 gigahertz. So it's, it almost looks like a headshock, right? These radiation beams get very, very na narrow, very, very pencil like. So it's, it's a real challenge to find this maximum emission. Okay. So, um, I have a table that shows with respect to the frequency. Where is the transition from electrically small to electrically large? And then you can see, okay, if you do measurements just at 30 megahertz, everything will be electrically small. At one gigahertz already, um, everything that is larger, let's say, than a cell phone will be electrically large. And if you go to 10 gigahertz, everything will be, except you have a very small chip, will be electrically large. And so the next table shows 
if we have an object, if we have an object with 50 centimeter diameter, let's say like a larger laptop, and uh, we would really like to capture the maximum emission, how many orientations we would need to measure. And then you can see, okay, up to one gigahertz, it's doable. And above this, it's, it's exploding. You, you need, you need very, very long time. And so the question is, would you like to have a very good deterministic environment like a semi-echoic chamber, but a huge uncertainty in your EUT? Your EUT is random. You don't know the direction of your EUT. Or would you rather like to have a random kind of statistic environment, but a deterministic EUT because the, the directivity of your EUT does not matter anymore? Um, so that's a very fundamental question. The good thing is, uh, here, this randomness, you don't know and you cannot control. And here you know it and you can control it because it's independent of frequency. It just depends on your number of frequencies. So this is the, the huge advantage here on this side, let's say. So at high frequencies, I would strongly, strongly recommend to do emission measurements in reverb chambers because it's much, much, much more robust. And um, yeah, so to show this, our or one of our colleagues in Magdeburg has done comparative measurements, taking a large equipment under test with some radiating transmission line antennas in a reverb chamber, in a semi-echoic chamber, and so measured emission here and there and plotted them into one joint diagram. And here it's converted with a directivity of one. So the, um, the difference between the two curves is more or less really the directivity of the equipment under test. But you can see in general, you get the very same result. And here it's done in a semi-echoic chamber for different stirrers, uh, for different steps of the turntable. So for 90 degree, you can see you get something. And for 10 degree, you get more. And probably if you would go down to two degree steps, one degree steps, this curve would get even higher and higher, uh, at least at some frequencies. Okay, so um, yeah. Uh, to, to, to make this short, everything has advantages and disadvantages. Um, and if we compare semi-echoic chamber, GTEM cell, reverb chamber, the reverb chamber has this big advantage that your test time stays constant, um, especially at high frequencies because of the field statistics. The GTEM cell has the advantage that you can go down to very low frequencies. GTEM cell always almost works at, um, at zero hertz. And Let's say the semi echoic chamber has the advantage that you can put very large equipment inside there. So I don't know too many GTEM cells where you can put a car in, but we can put even large, larger cars into our semi echoic chamber. And that's why um, the reverb chamber will never fully replace the semi echoic chamber and vice versa. But this one here, especially at high frequencies, has large, large, large advantages. So the more fundamental question is what is a good measurement? Electrical field strength maximum in a certain distance. At low frequencies, probably yes. But at high frequencies, it's much better to measure this total radiated power. But at the moment, we have no limits for this. And another fundamental question is, is this semi-anechoic, perfect, reflection-free environment really? This is what's happening in real life. Because if you also look at this building, there are uh, still... Uh, reinforced concrete walls, and there will be always some kind of reflections um, in, in the surrounding, maybe not as highly reflected as, as in a reverb chamber, but, but still um, not reflection-free. So the, the truth here is probably somewhere in between. And the final question, we can come back to the question from the beginning, um, is there really all power going to the chicken? Yeah, so this is this is really a picture from this microwave memo from this Carl Baum paper. So you see the chamber, you see the chicken inside there, you see some port where energy goes in and we, we have the stirrer to steer the field and then he's setting up a power balance saying, okay, the input power must go into power losses into the wall, into the stirrer and into the chicken. And if we say, okay, we have very low loss walls, we have a very low loss stirrer, then really all power needs to go to the chicken. Um, and yeah, this is um, 
some argument for, okay, the reverb chamber won't work as a test environment for immunity tests because independent of frequency, all the power always goes into the chicken. But we have done lots of research that shows uh, the, the opposite. Uh, you, can, you can nicely find resonances of your device in a test inside the reverb chamber. So this year at the end um, is not really true. Okay, so this concludes my talk. Thanks for attending. And now I think we have time uh, for some questions.